moment to. There we go. Take it away, Diane. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Apologies for the technical issues we started out with, but uh, glad you could be here for Now Hear This Lessons in Music Advisory, presented by Katie Irons from Pierce County Library and John Fawcett from Kitsap Regional Library. Uh, we have some uh, very interesting characters presenting today. John Fawcett is a reference librarian and the adult music selector for Kitsap Regional Library. His interests include spending time with his family, hiking, baseball, listening to and playing music, watching movies, reading, biking, sailing, and disc golf. He cries every time he watches The Notebook. Who doesn't? Has secretly been an ABBA fan since the 70s, is quite graceful for a large man, and chicks dig him. Above all, he's humble. Katie Irons is the adult music and film selector for Pierce County Library System and the author of Film Programming for Public Libraries, available from ALA Publications. Katie has loved music since her grandmother taught her to play show tunes on an old Hammond organ. Boy, that brings back memories. Her musical interests range from ragtime to rap. Katie lives in Tacoma, Washington with her fiance and three remarkably beautiful and intelligent pets. Above all, Katie is more humble than Josh Fawcett. So much more. Well, take it away, uh, my wonderful uh, presenters today, and we're, we're really looking forward to this. I'm going to interject here for just a moment. We do have a couple of things we need to discuss. Um, our facilitators are not here today. Diane is stepping in. Thank you very much, Diane, for assisting us. Uh, for technical support, we do have Joe Olivar and uh, myself, Jeremy Stroud. Thank you, Joe, for uh, assisting as well, especially with the, with the technical difficulties this morning. Uh, I will type out my contact information in the chat here shortly, so if you have any troubles during the presentation, please feel free to get a hold of me. And today's presentation is brought to you by the Office of the Secretary of State and uh, Washington State Library, and we are funded partially by the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, or Services, sorry, uh, LSTAI funds. So now I will go ahead and ask that each individual please type in where you're from, uh, name, library organization. You can put in the city if you're not comfortable sharing the organization itself. Uh, we're required by the Office of Financial Management to track attendees. And while folks are typing away, I'll go ahead and now pass the mic on to John and Katie. Hi. Um, oops. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Oh, sorry. We can indeed. Yes. Okay. Great. Hi. I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties this morning. And going forward, John and I are sharing a set of headphones and a microphone, so it may be a little clumsy. Um, but yes, welcome. Thank you so much for coming to uh, now hear this lessons in music advisory. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that when we did this uh, presentation live um, at Whale, um, we actually had a music list that we played in the background, but that just doesn't really work in this environment. But if um, we'll be sharing our email addresses with you at the end, and if you would like to hear that, uh, I have created the list on Spotify. If you send me an email, I can send you the link. So <clears throat> um, when John first approached me to do a program about music, I was actually really reluctant. Um, and part of that is because I am so passionate about music, um, even more so than I am about movies. Um, which I do a lot of work with. Um, but I feel that music appreciation is a very personal thing. You like what you like. You don't like what you don't like. And more than any other art form, music really affects us viscerally um, and literally. Uh, sound waves move through us. They resonate inside of us. It, music can lower our blood pressure or raise it. It can evoke memories and feelings. Um, and you know, music can soothe the savage beast, but it can also be used to torture people. Um, but John was really persistent, and I realized that, you know, our job is really about helping people to find music they love, regardless of how we feel about it. And um, so we've chosen to speak to you today about six genres that can fall outside many of our comfort zones. Um, none of them are strange or avant-garde, but depending on what you love and respond to, these may be types of music you just don't know anything about. 
Um, this isn't deep level music theory because we don't have time for that. Um, but we're going to give you a quick tour of what may be unfamiliar territory for you. And um, we've also created lists and some titles in each genre, which again, we'd be happy to email out to anyone who is interested. And now I'm going to pass it over to John. So as we move back and forth, the transition may take just a few seconds. So let's see here. Hang on just a second. Can we advance this? There it is. OK, so talking about music is like dancing about architecture. And if you guys were here, I'd see a show of hands because I wanted to know if anybody know who's heard that quote and who said it. So I thought it was Elvis Costello at first. And then I found several quotes. So we want to go to the next slide. Um, oh. That's okay. So anyway, uh, it, it was actually uh, Elvis Costello, Frank Zappa, and then, but it was Martin Mull Mel who actually said it in the 70s. He was being interviewed for an article in a magazine. And the quote, actually, the idea of this quote goes back to the New Republic of the turn of the last century. And what was said was strictly considered writing about music is as illogical as singing about economics. So in our research, for this session, we examined the typical record store classifications and came up with many, many genres of music, excluding the ex-subgenres, blues, bluegrass, I mean, all the way to world music. And since we're limited in time, there's no way we could possibly cover all, uh, I think we picked a dozen here, different genres. So we limited it to six. And neither one of us is a youth services librarian, so we're not going to talk about kids' music. And we could easily do a program just on world music. So we decided to focus, not to focus on either of those. And we figured most people could be able to, would be able to come up with a pop or a rock artist to recommend. So we selected six genres in which we thought people may need some support. And you want me to just skip over this? OK. And uh, let's see. So we wanted to talk about uh, music with its senses, the hearing, the sight, the touch, the taste. But the, the big thing is music is a connector. It's a way we connect as humans. We gather at live shows. We share what we like online. We talk to each other about what we like and what we don't like. And the music itself is collected, is, is connected. Um, there's a common thread in nearly every type of music. And almost all of it is derivative at this point. So Chuck Berry's influence on Keith Richards and the compositions of the Rolling Stones. The Grateful Dead's obvious nod to the blues, folk, and bluegrass traditions in their two most commercially successful albums, American Beauty and Working Men's Dead. And of course, Led Zeppelin, most people say heavy metal, but they were a blues band through and through. Music from the 20th, from the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, let's see, has its roots in the blues. Three chords, five notes, repetitive lyrical structure. The blues ain't nothing but a good man feeling bad. Some say Big Bill Brunsey said it. Others say it was W.C. Handy. Either way, blues is older than jazz, country, and rock. No one's sure of the exact date of blues, but it's just estimated that it's early 19th century. And everyone agrees that the blues influenced much of our modern musical landscape. So hang on just a second. That might be easier. Okay. Yeah. Let's just use here. All right. So. Oh. You're talking online, so you're. Sorry. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Just back to technical details. I'm so sorry. So opera. Um, opera can be really intimidating. Um, opera aficionados are the people that intimidate classical music fans, which is really saying something. Um, Opera consists of a dramatic text called a, a libretti paired with a musical score. Um, and when we think of opera today, we tend to think of the music, but it's really a theatrical art form that includes singing, instruments, dance, acting, scenery, and costumes. Opera grew out of uh, these extravagant entertainments put on by royalty and the nobility in honor of birthdays or marriages or visitations, um, giant processionals with draw-dropping costumes and special effects, 
often with themes based on classical mythology. And it's from these um, 17th century royal extravaganzas that both opera and ballet were born. Um, Eurydice is the earliest known opera to survive complete until this day. It was composed by um, Jacopo Perry in honor of the wedding of Maria de' Medici and uh, Henry IV of France. It reflects a strong influence of ancient Greek drama, um, as does L'Orfeo by Monteverde. Uh, published in 1609, L'Orfeo is the oldest opera that's still regularly performed. Um, other Early opera composers included um, Scarlatti, Vivaldi, and Nicola Porpora. Um, in 1637, the first public opera house was opened in Venice. And that moved opera from the exclusive domain of the courts to the public sphere. And the opera, and opera began to spread throughout Italy and the rest of Europe. Um, Italian remained the dominant language for most composers, to, regardless of where they were uh, writing from. Uh, and it was sort of seen as the classy, uh, the classy thing to write opera in Italian. So um, the development of opera in Germany really shows this tension between those who felt opera in Italian was the only true opera and those who wanted to hear opera in their own tongue. Uh, many German uh, composers like Johann Huss, Christoph Gluch, and George Frederick Handel composed primarily in Italian. Um, but a growing merchant or burger class wanted to hear uh, opera in their native tongue, and they had the money to pay for it. Um, uh, and, then, and then came Mozart. Uh, Mozart had already composed a few legendary operas, such as Don Giovanni, Cozy Fantuti and the Mare de Figaro. And then he was encouraged to compose The Magic Flute by the owner of a public opera house. Um, it was really a huge success. The opera combined elements of both high and low opera, complex musicality, and it was in German. Um, although he died a few months after its premiere, the opera's uh, popularity continued to grow and have a profound influence on future German composers. Um, in the let's see, in the 1800s, different styles of opera began emerging. Some influenced by the country or region of the composers, and others by political events. In Italy, the bel canto or beautiful singing style um, came uh, became popular, featuring ornate, complicated phrasing. Uh, as exemplified in Donizetti Lucia de Lammermoor. But then that was replaced by a more forceful singing style made popular by uh, Verdi in La Traviata. Um, growing na nationalism uh, following the Napoleonic Wars influenced many composers through the 1800s, including Verdi, Beethoven, and Wagner. In the late 1800s, Wagner created a kind of opera, and this I'm going to try and pronounce this correctly, uh, known as Gesamtkunstwerk, or a complete work of art. This fused music, poetry, dance, and art, and horses on stage. His operas were strongly influenced by German folk tales and legends and pushed an idea of a German identity during a time that Germany was emerging from a long period of being loosely gathered states under various control. Other German composers working at the same time, including Strauss and Richard Strauss and Johann Strauss II, did their best to create work, their own work in Wagner's immense shadow, including um, Johann Strauss's Der Fledermaus. Uh, meanwhile, in France, a combination of opera and spoken dialogue called opera comique was becoming pop popular. Um, despite the name, opera comique can be quite dark and tragic, as exemplified by the most favorite, first famous opera comique, Bizet's Carmen. In England, there was a resurgence of opera in the late 1800s, led by Gilbert and Sullivan, 
and their comic operas, sometimes called operettas, included the HMS Pinafore, the Pirates of Penzance, and the P Mikado. They were, remain exceptionally popular to this day. Um, the 1900s brought new experimentation and modernism into opera. Composers, including Schoenberg, W.C. Puccini, and Britton, began to experiment with atonality, chromaticism, and dissonance in their work. Um, artists began using more modern sources of literature and history as their inspiration. Uh, George Gershwin's opera Porgy and Bess is set in the 1920s Charleston. Um, John Adams composed Nixon in China, about Nixon in China. Um, there's also uh, Turn of the Screw and Billy Bud by uh, Britton. And uh, of Mice and Men by uh, Carlisle Floyd. Um, in the 20th century, we also saw a rise of musicals with a more operatic structure. Uh, Porgy and Bess opened on Broadway, but it is now accepted as part of the opera canon. West Side Story, Sweeney Todd, and Les Miserables are a few of the musicals that are somehow, sometimes performed in modern opera houses. Um, but the musical has not completely consumed the opera. Um, new operas continue to be written and performed in the 21st century, including uh, Brokeback Mountain, um, the opera Anna Nicole by Mark Anthony Turnage, uh, Mansfield Park by Jonathan Dove, um, Rockland the Opera by Jukka Linkola, which is about a miners' strike in Michigan. Um, and Dead Man Walking and Moby Dick are also examples of some modern operas. And from opera, we'll scoot right into jazz. So with apologies to the masters, I'm going to do a one-minute history of jazz. I was going to see if this would... Oh, yeah, I can control it. Cool. Um, okay, so jazz music was born in New Orleans just before the turn of the last century. Beyond syncopation, improvisation, and the distinctive voice, jazz has had few constants. It's always changing, adapting, reinventing itself. It's being propelled forward by the artists as well as the fans. Jazz is a hybrid derived from music brought to America by West African slaves, the American folk and blues traditions, particularly from the African-American perspective, and European classical and opera and it's all mixed up like a giant pot of gumbo. Ragtime was the first jazz music. Composers such as Scott Joplin started simply by using piano-centered bands to play variations of musical form we know today as the march, the so John Philip Sousa kind of stuff. Ragtime gave way to Dixieland, a polyrhythmic blend, which took music from an ensemble approach with the players focused on a melody to one that featured soloists improvising over that same melody. Dixieland morphed into the big band sound, which had stylish large combinations with band leaders, singers, and great melodies. Big band was the most popular music from the mid-30s through the war years. By the end of World War II, some musicians chose their own path of discovery. The result was bebop, a less confined approach to jazz than big band. Bebop paved a way for free jazz, where conventional styling gave way to a more experimental approach in finding one's sound. And then bebop also morphed into the more laid-back uh, West Coast or cool jazz. As rock dominated the charts in the 60s, popularity of jazz began to wane. Musicians such as Miles Davis combined rock with jazz to give us fusion. And I want to mention that Miles Davis may have been one of the greatest pioneers in jazz. You can find him involved with nearly every change in jazz music from the big band era all the way until his death in the 90s. And today's jazz music benefits from all previously mentioned styles and experiments. I have a few jazz recordings that I want to share with you that you may not be familiar with. The first one's Chet Baker in Tokyo. This two-disc recording of a Japanese performance is a stellar representation of a trumpet-led combo interpreting jazz standards and it's one of the best releases of Baker's career. This is a great suggestion for fans of Miles Davis who are looking for something else. And I can listen to this too over and over and never get tired of it. Sadly, uh, Baker, who ravaged by years of drug use, died less than a year after this was recorded. 
Next one is Bill Evans' Waltz for Debbie. Evans was a classically trained pianist studying in Louisiana. In the 50s, he moved to New York, worked with jo uh, band leader George Russell. In 1958, Evans joined the Miles Davis group. A year later, they recorded Kind of Blue, the best-selling jazz album in history. Shortly after that, Evans struck out on his own. Waltz for Debbie was recorded 50 years ago as a live session at the Village Vanguard in New York. Evans' piano is just, it just flows like water. It's wonderful. This is the last recording of the Evans, leg of Evans' legendary trio with Paul Motion and Scotty LaFaro. Matter of fact, Scotty LaFaro died just days after this was captured on tape. There are many iterations of this recording, including remastered editions with extra tracks uh, and the complete Village Band rec Guard recordings from 1961. Waltz for Debbie remains one of my great, one of my favorite jazz CDs. Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones, live art. So a banjo player, yes, I said a banjo player from the Big Apple, named for Bela Bartok, renewed the country's interest in bluegrass with his band, New Grass Revival, in the 70s and the 80s. And then he left that, completely abandoned it, and started touring and recording with a completely different group of world-class musicians. You get everything on this album, jazz, world. He's got a tube and throat singer who performs with a band. There's rap, American standards, and you can certainly hear Bela's bluegrass roots in the live performances. I saw Bela in the Fleck Tones, uh, Sans the Throat Singer at Woodland Park Zoo many years ago. It's one of Seattle's best venues. I love just sitting on the grass and watching the performance. And they're over by 9.30, so old fogies like me don't have to stay out too late. Anyway, Bela came out for an encore without the band. It's just him and his banjo. He played some Mozart. Then he morphed into some jazz standards, went into a medley of Beatles tunes, and finished up with John Lennon's Imagine. And everyone was so captivated by this last performance that you could have heard a pin drop as he waved and said, good night. Next one we have is Keith Jarrett, the Cologne concert. This is jazz music for people who don't like jazz music. It's a live recording in which Jarrett improvises every note except for the encore. It meanders a bit, and it has its manic moments, but mostly it's simple, melodic, soothing solo piano. And the performance almost didn't happen. At the time, Jarrett was suffering from some back and problems, and he hadn't been sleeping well. He'd just spent several hours in the car. The piano on stage was a practice piano. The actual concert piano was moved to the side by mistake. And it had some serious issues with the middle register. And the young promoter had booked the show to begin at 11.30 p.m. after another event. It's already in there. But we're lucky this did because it, it's one of the best selling, selling jazz records of all time. So I, I, I would really highly recommend this one. And then Joe Jackson's Jump and Jive. Jackson first stepped on the American music scene during the new wave craze of the late 70s. He had a hit with uh, Is She Really Going Out With Him? So how does a British new wave musician create one of the best swing CDs in history? Love a Louis Jordan tunes? General love of music? Who knows? But if you aren't up and dancing when this disc is spinning, Jack, you did. This is the go-to disc for the night spots in northern New England in the summer of 81, and this recording was on the crest of the wave for the resurgence of jump bands like Squirrel Nut Zippers, Big Bad Booty Doo Daddy, and the Brian Setzer Orchestra, not to mention the popularity of swing dance. In fact, Jackson's next two albums, Night and Day and Body and Soul, contained a real jazz sound. And uh, his latest release is a collection of nicely arranged Duke Ellington tunes. Okay, so now we're going to move on to country and western. Um, <clears throat> so country and western, uh, well, country music, originally emerged from the folk music genres of the American Southeast. Um, immigrants from the old world brought with them their songs and instruments and passed them around. Um, a strong Scots-Irish folk tradition permeates early country music. Um, but other common instruments used in this early music included the German dulcimer, the Italian mandolin, the Spanish guitar, and the West African banjo. <clears throat> it was old world music played in a new American melting pot way. Um, the first country music scene emerged in 1920s Atlanta, where producers promoted this music to the broader American audience as hillbilly music. Uh, the music, which could be sad and mournful or cheerful and toe-tapping, 
really appealed to the Depression era sensibilities of the country. Um, the film Oh Brother Where Out Thou gives a really good grounding in this kind of music. Um, early country artists included Fiddlin' John Carson, Vernon Dahlhart, Uncle Dave Macon, the Carter family, DeFord Bailey, and Charlie Poole, many of whom became stars thanks to the Grand Old Opry, which began broadcasting in 1925 and continues to this day. Uh, by the 1930s, uh, westerns filled the movie theaters and cowboy music, uh, ballads of the lone cow hand on the Rio Grande, uh, made singing cowboys and cowgirls such as Gene Autry, Patsy Montana, uh, Roy Rogers and the Sons of the Pioneers, um, made them famous. Around this time there was also a move to rebrand this hillbilly music uh, with a more appealing name. And uh, so country western was really born as a merging of two similar musical genres into one appealing, saleable package. Um, starting in the 1930s, and one could argue continuing to this very day, country music began birthing subgenres, uh, some of which were embraced by the country western establishment and others that were not. Western swing, hillbilly boogie, and honky tonk were all early offshoots of country that challenged the establishment by adding drums, horns, and even electric guitars. Bob Willis and the Texas Playboy, an early pioneer of Hillbilly Boogie, was banned from playing the Grand Ole Opry after he snuck his drums on stage during uh, a show. Um, Honky Tonk, which had its roots in western swing and ranchero music, began to expand in popularity during World War II. And nowadays, the honky-tonk sound is really what we think of as mainstream country music. Um, early honky-tonk stars included Lefty Frizzell, George Jones, Kitty Wells, and of course, the legendary Hank Williams. Um, the 50s and 60s were a really interesting time for country music. Um, a mixture of rock and country that we know as rockabilly really started to become very popular. The biggest rock star in the world, Elvis, started hitting on the country charts, while country artists like Johnny Cash and Carl Perkins started hitting the pop charts. Rockabilly was the uh, start of a difficult dance between country and rock that really continues till today. Um, from this point on, you also see uh, tension developing between certain kinds of country music that are very supported by the Nashville country music machine and uh, some country music that is not supported by them at all. And, but occasionally the kind that is not uh, becomes wildly popular and Nashville chases to embrace it or other times not. Um, in response to rockabilly, Nashville started promoting a kind of music they called countrypolitan. Um, as big as rockabilly was, it was young people music, and Nashville wanted to keep its older conservative fans happy. Um, Patsy Cline is the most famous of the early countrypolitan stars, which also include Jim Reeves, Porter Wagoner, and most of the artists that you see here, George Jones, Tammy Wynette, Loretta, Dolly, and Conway Twitty. Um, in the 70s, uh, some country artists began rebelling against this sharp suit, clean cut, smooth harmony sound coming out of Nashville and wanted to push out their own sound. Uh, Waylon Jennings, Chris Christopherson, and Willie Nelson started producing a more raw, raucous sound, heavy on electric guitar, with lyrics about sinning and drinking and loving and dying. Outlaw Country was insanely popular, and the album Wanted Outlaws, uh, featuring Waylon and Willie, was the first country album to ever be certified platinum. Um, Outlaw Country was heavy on the male artists, but Women, including Jesse Coulter and Emmy Lou Harris, also came from the outlaw country my, uh, milieu. Um, but Nashville continued to push 
a clean cut country music with pop sensibility in the 70s and 80s. But, uh, you know, in, in addition, Nashville kind of grabbed onto the trappings of the outlaw country. Um, in, uh, if not, some would argue, you know, in the spirit, the real spirit of outlaw country, uh, they sort of put on the costumes of it. Uh, Kenny Rogers' Gambler is an example of the long line of mother-approved outlaws that began climbing the charts in 80s and 90s that included uh, Garth Brooks, Kenny Chesney, and Blake Shelton. Um, country crossover continues to dominate the airwaves today with uh, many country artists who are successful, as successful on the pop charts as they are on the country charts. And uh, whatever Nash Nashville's doing, it's working. Uh, in 2013, country music past rock is the most popular musical genre in the U.S. based on albums sold. Um, but the story on country music isn't quite over. Um, where we once had outlaw country, we now have something called alt country. And alt country is a new term used to describe um, basically um, country music that uh, country radio refuses to play. Um, Lyle Lovett and Katie Lang were early examples of what we now think of as alt country. Uh, they both ex achieved great success as country artists, but they were never played on mainstream country radio. Um, today, artists such as Shelby Lynn, Shooter Jennings, the old 97s, the drive-by truckers, and Whiskey Town all have earned this alt country title, um, but even formerly lauded country stars have found themselves in what can feel like an alt country wilderness. Uh, Willie Nelson, Dixie Chicks, Emmy Lou Harris, Lucinda Williams, Alison Krauss, these are all country mus uh, musicians who um, have been, uh, had, their, had uh, the backs turned on them by uh, Nashville and the in country music industry. Um, even as illustrious a superstar as Johnny Cash discovered himself everywhere but country radio when he began releasing recordings with the non-country label American Recordings. Um, even though this work was uh, some of the best, most powerful work of his career, um, you know, and after winning the 1998 Grammy for Best Country Music Album, American Recordings took out a full-page ad in Billboard magazine featuring this picture of Johnny taken during his legendary Folsom Prison recordings in 69. And the message says there, for those who can't read it, American Recordings and Johnny Cash would like to acknowledge the Nashville Radio Establishment and Country Radio for your support. Um, and Willie Nelson has this picture hung up on his bus. And that's a wonderful segue right into gospel music. So we're going to start out with traditional gospel. I'll, I'll talk about the three subgenres of. Uh, uh, we we actually refer to it in uh, the classification as sacred music at uh, our library, and pretty much anything uh, gets put into that. So we're going to start out with traditional gospel. Traditional gospel music is performed by large choirs, smaller combos, and individuals. The uniting theme, it's Christian-based, and it offers praise or thanks to God and or Christ. The origins can be traced back to a period when America allowed slavery and the African cultures were combined with Western Christianity, the one result being the emergence of the spiritual. What most would identify today as gospel began in the earliest 20th, 20th century with roots in the blues and the holy roller churches. It offered a more enthusiastically participatory form of worship. They encouraged members to testify, speaking or singing spontaneously about their fate. In the 20s, many artists worked as traveling, traveling preachers. They started making records in a style that melded traditional religious themes with the musical aspects of the day of barrel house, boogie woogie, and blues. With the popularity of the Mills Brothers around World War II, the quartet became the preferred format for the gospel group. After the war, the, emotional, the emotion in the delivery was ramped up, 
ad-libbing during the song occurred regularly and the music began to take direction from the character of the lead vocalist with the rest of the group relegated to a more supporting role. When Roots music, uh, and I'm talking about folks, blues, spirituals, uh, enjoyed a resurgence in the late 50s and early 60s, gospel received a boost in popularity as well. In fact, gospel had a huge influence on popular music in the 60s and the 70s. Godspell, Jesus Christ Superstar were award-winning musicals on Broadway, and they had best-filling soundtracks as well. And many R&B singers got their starts by singing in the choir. Sam Cooke, Ray Charles, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Marvin Gaye, Wilson Pickett, Al Green, they all had their roots in the church and gospel writ. So my two picks, two suggestions that I have for traditional gospel, Aretha Franklin, Amazing Grace, The Complete Recordings. In my humble opinion, Aretha Franklin could sing the ingredients of a candy bar wrapper and it would sound great. This recording was originally released as a double LP in 1972. It was recorded at the New Temple Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles. It's been remastered and expanded, and you can even hear some of Reverend James Cleveland in the comments from his service. The highlights, an unbelievably soulful rendition of Amazing Grace clocking in at 10 plus minutes. Uh, Mary, Don't You Weep with Aretha telling the story accompanied by the Southern California Community Choir and the Queen of Souls moving rendition of Carol King's You've Got a Friend, which wanders in and out of the song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. If you aren't a believer, you will be after listening to this recording. Franklin won a Grammy for Best Gospel Performance for this LP, and not only is it one of the biggest selling traditional, uh, biggest selling albums of her career, it's one of the biggest selling gospel albums of all time. Next up, the best of the Staples singers. So Robux Staples, uh, Robux Staples, the patriarch of the family, formed the group with his children. He began appearing in Chicago area churches around just after World War II. They had various recording contracts throughout the years, but enjoyed their biggest success with Stax Records in the early 70s, and they were part of that great Muscle Shoals sound. Staples' family had several crossover hits on the Billboard Top 100 singles, and the R&B chart, but make no mistake about it, they were, gospel, they were gospel act first. And while the album contains a few covers, the majority of the tracks are songs about improving your life and creating a positive self-image. Next up is Southern Gospel. As with traditional gospel, Southern Gospel is Christian-based and offers praise, worship, or thanks to God in Christ. And Southern Gospel also has its roots in the blues. While soloists, duos, and trios were present, the old-timey quartet singing, usually white males, was a prevailing act of the subgenre for many years. Southern gospel tends to lean more towards country, bluegrass, and folk traditions for its style and sound. The term southern is a nod to the area in which, of the U.S. in which the genre was first popular. And southern gospel was a huge influence on popular performers such as Patsy Cline, Tennessee Ernie Ford, and Elvis Presley. Southern gospel music experienced a resurgence during the 90s thanks to the efforts of Bill and Gloria Gaither and their Gaither homecoming tours and videos. It began as a reunion of many of the best known and loved Southern gospel performers who were still around at the time. They continue to this day. Now, while most, while most devoted fans remain in the Southeast and Southwest United States, Southern gospel enjoys a healthy following in Canada, Great Britain, Australia, and New Zealand. And I have two suggestions for uh, Southern Gospel. First one's Emmy Lou Harris, Angel Band. Um, Emmy Lou was born and raised in the South. She quit college and became a folk singer in Greenwich Village in the early 60s. She was noticed by members of the Flying Burrito Brothers. She worked with the brothers' former leader, uh, Graham Parsons, where she was schooled in country, folk, and bluegrass music. And the rest is history. Angel Band's an acoustic collection of, a gospel, of gospel songs, dozen solid tracks, with some of countries and bluegrasses biggest superstars backing her up. Vince, Kill, Vince Gill with mandolin and vocals, Jerry Douglas on the dobro, Mark O'Connor on fiddle. Highlights for this is when they ring those golden bells, uh, the Lubin Brothers, Who Will Sing For Me, and of course the title track. This, all the arrangements are, are they're very sparse, they're stripped down. Vince Gill's high harmony complimenting Emmy Lou's golden voice has a good old-timey feel that would be right at home on the grand old Opry, and it's sure to satisfy any Southern gospel fan. And uh, 
Oh, I do have one more. Sorry. Allison Krauss, who uh, um, Katie mentioned earlier as far as the uh, uh, one of the performance who's kind of been shunned by traditional country. Uh, Allison Krauss and the Cox family, in my humble opinion, this is a, this is a mega group. It's a combination of some of the most talented people in, uh, in bluegrass and country music. Uh, the Cox family hails from Cotton, Cotton Valley, Louisiana. Willard, the dad, put together a bluegrass group with his son Sidney and daughters Evelyn and Suzanne. All are accomplished singers and musicians, with Sidney being a very highly regarded and sought after singer song, a songwriter. The group began performing at fairs and festivals in the 70s, and they got their big break when Alison Krauss brought them around to records and began collaborating on their recordings. And it certainly didn't hurt when Counting Crows invited them as their opening act during a North American tour. So if you're not familiar with Alison Krauss, I'm willing to bet that you've heard her. She's the lead vocal on Down to the River to Pray from the Coen Brothers film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Krauss won a fiddle contest when she was 10. She was recording by she was but she was recording by the time she was 14, and the rest is history. She's had 14 CDs, appeared on multiple son soundtracks, and she's won 27 Grammy Awards. I Know Who Holds Tomorrow won the Grammy in 94 for Best Country Gospel Bluegrass Album. Uh, highlights, Walk on Over God's Country, oh, excuse me, Walk Over God's Heaven. It's an up-tempo rendition of the Thomas Dorsey spiritual with three-part harmony and a walk and bass line that'll get your toes tapping. And then there's also a uh, uh, where no one stands alone, an old Merle Haggard tune that'll make your dog weep. And everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die by Loretta Lynn. And then the last of the subgenres for gospel is contemporary Christian music. So traditional gospel is associated with a more soulful R&B type of sound. Southern gospel has a more country sound. Contemporary Christian music is pretty much everything else, the pop, the rock, the rap. The one big difference that separates contemporary Christian music from its cousins, Southern gospel and traditional gospel, is that the Christian me message may not be as overt and quite often has double entendre lyrics, which could be interpreted as a devout love for God or an earthly love for man or woman. So I have a couple of recommendations here. Uh, first one's Noah Gundison, Ledges. This young man's from Centralia, Washington. He's was raised in a very large, very devout family. He started his music career under his father's guidance during his early teens. His compositions remain in the folk rock sort of environment. And you can tell from his music that he's had a lot of exposure to traditional hymns, folk, bluegrass, country, and rock. He tours with some of his family members. There's an amazing YouTube video of him with three siblings singing a cappella in a train station. It will send chills up and down your spine. It's amazing. He's in his 20s, uh, but his songs portray an old soul spirituality that I find refreshing. Gives me hope that our musical futures will be more than dubstep and DJs playing electric dance music from their laptops. Next one I have is uh, U2 Joshua Tree. Most people don't think of this as a spiritual album, but uh, it certainly is. Um, let's see, fifth studio album from the Irish Quartet. Now, by this time, they're extremely successful, but this is the disc that catapulted U2 into the stratosphere. This, one, this is the one that guaranteed them stadium shows for the rest of their lives. Just about everyone's heard the tracks from Joshua Tree, but they may have overlooked the spiritual side of the album. The album's a result of the band's search for and subsequent understanding of its heritage, both culturally and musically, and it's combined with a fascination for what they saw as the myth of America, and then filtered through the sobering reality of their experience in America. Uh, my favorite track on this album is Running to Stand Still. It's a musical portrait about a, junk, a junkie wanting something completely different. And then the last on, the, on Contemporary Christian, Wow Hits. EMI started these samplers in the late ni in the mid 90s and since then EMI has been absorbed by Universal and Sony, Sony but the wow hips keep keep coming. Um, think of it as now that's what I call Christian music. These sets feature the most popular contemporary Christian music artists from the major Christian labels performing their most popular songs. These are the Billboard Hot 100 singles of the sub subgenre. Hello. So now we're moving on to rap. Um, 
Before I start, um, I just want to say uh, we did get started a little bit late, um, but John and I are going to continue. Um, we're, uh, we got two genres left to go through, and um, so uh, we're just going to keep on keeping on. Okay, so here we are uh, with rap music, and uh, I'd like to start us with some quotes. Um, and I'll give you a moment to sort of look at those quotes. Um, you have a, a laborious and puerile barbarity, which is a critic discussing Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Um, we have America is home to the most dreary, the most brainless, the most offensive form of music that the earth has ever known. That is a Vanity Fair critic talking about jazz music. And then, uh, we have Frank Sinatra's opinion on rock and roll, the most brutal, ugly, degenerate, vicious form of expression, lewd, sly, in plain fact, dirty. Now, given that I'm talking about rap, you, it's probably not like uh, impossible to see where I'm going here. Uh, when rap music began to emerge in uh, during the late 70s and 80s, it's really fair to say that uh, the descriptions of it uh, from a lot of people were similar to these quotes. Um, it isn't music. Who can understand what they're saying? It glorifies crime. It glorifies sex, drugs, and, you know, horrible behavior. Um, a lot of the comments had very racial undertones or overtones. Um, but I really like these quotes because they really show so clearly that there's nothing new under the sun, including how we respond to new music. Um, rap music, like rock and jazz before it, was born of multiple artistic and musical inspirations fed by social influences and is traced an arc from the music of the alienated to the music of Top 40 radio and iTunes commercials. Um, so rap, most people agree that rap music, as we know it, was birthed in the United States by a Jamaican immigrant named Clive Campbell. Uh, Clive, who went by the name DJ Cool Herc, began throwing dance parties in his Bronx neighborhood during the 70s using the dual turntable style he learned in Jamaica. Um, when, with dance parties, if you have two turntables, you can just keep the music going. You don't have to have that awkward switch out when you're changing a record or flipping it over. You just keep the music going seamlessly, and uh, that's what Cool Herc began to do. Um, as uh, time went on, um, Herc and other artists began experimenting with uh, things like scratching and looping and sampling. All of these are ways to keep the energy high, a way to keep that dance music, focusing on the parts of the dance music that keep people dancing and taking out the parts that, you know, where they says slow down and look at their watch and go to the bathroom. Um, MCs um, or, or masters of ceremonies also started playing a role. These were the guys with the microphones. Um, they were keeping people engaged and moving, often with a call and response type thing. You know, party people in the house say, yeah, or, uh, you know, instructions. <laughs> Wave your hands in the air like you just don't care. Um, so early rappers, uh, Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bombada, Kid and Play, Salt and Pepper, uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff, Beastie Boys, these are all examples of these early rap artists who created, who established their careers with a fun, energized form of rap that included charm, cool, humor, um, along with just a pounding beat to keep the audience engaged and moving. Um, some MC MCs began expanding their patter and using rap to tell stories and to comment on social conditions. Um, early rappers cite similar influences in developing their rhythmic patois, including jazz, spoken word artists, and even comedians like Richard Pryor. Um, Gil Scott Heron is famous for his piece, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, and Maria Van Peebles are often 
cited as proto-rappers for their spoken word work that they did in the 60s. So 1988 was just a seminal year for rap. That was the year that changed everything for rap. Um, the first thing is that um, the global phenomenon of MTV finally started listening to its critics that were pointing out it was remar remarkably uh, white in the artists that they, were that they were playing all the time. And so uh, since they were in New York and rap was a vibrant part of the New York culture by that time, they started a show called Yo! MTV Raps. Um, and I don't think they expected much of it. I don't even know that the people who went on Yo! MTV Raps expected that anyone was watching, but the world was watching. Um, not only people in urban areas who were already familiar with rap, but kids, suburbans, you know, suburban kids out in the middle of Kansas, uh, they saw and heard rap and they loved it. Um, in addition, in 88, uh, the film Colors about uh, Los Angeles gang wars was a box office hit, um, and its soundtrack was uh, just a box office, I mean, a block billboard, uh, billboard uh, hit. Um, it it uh, basically uh, got rap music out there in, uh, you know, suburban kids' bedrooms. It, they started climbing up the regular charts. People started becoming aware, uh, more uh, pronounced, of this phenomenon of rap music. Then um, the group Public Enemy released the album It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, while uh, another group in Los Angeles re uh, releases the group um, Straight Outta Compton. That was NWA. Um, between these two albums, Public Enemy and NWA, um, really created what we now call gangster rap. But these two albums also really show the tension within the idea of gangster rap. Um, Public Enemy's albums, their lyrics, they were uh, a wall of sound just delivering uh, furious lyrics about a broken system. It was people expressing um, just the rage of uh, living in a broken society that doesn't seem to care about them anymore. Um, NWA really focused more on, you know, lauding the gangster lifestyle. Guns, drugs, and hoes, and, um, but they did it in a really clever, catchy, um, danceable way. Um, so gangster rap really began to dominate the industry at that point. You had a, a joining Public Enemy on the East Coast. You had Wu-Tang Clan, the notorious uh, B.I.G. Um, then on the uh, West Coast, you had um, Ice-T, N.W.A., Tupac Shakur. Um, I am not going to get into the whole idea of the East Coast, West Coast rap battles. I don't really understand it myself. It was a sort of important part of the formative years of rap. Um, but what I find more interesting is that while the New York and LA were essentially fighting over who was the best, um, rap was spreading throughout the country. And, uh, you know, rap scenes sprung up in Detroit, Miami, uh, Atlanta, St. Louis, and each of them added their own spin and their own um, style to rap music. Um, you've got your crunk, Dirty South, Chopped and Screwed, Latin, and Chicano, and these all were about, you know, playing with tempo, playing with rhythm and rhyme. Um, you know, the kind of music that you sampled and looped. Um, and uh, and so uh, while New York and L.A. were sort of busy duking it out, um, it was, rap was spreading. Um, and the Northwest has actually had a pretty rich, if less well-known, rap scene. A lot of it emerged from uh, 
dance scenes at various Seattle high schools in the 70s and 80s. And then that was fed by the influx of soldiers who were coming to this area from all over the country, each bringing their own tastes in rap music. And, uh, you know, rap was really like the underground alternative in the Northwest for to grunge, which was maybe the underground alternative everywhere else. But here it was, you know, eating the music scene alive. So, um, it hasn't been entirely underground. Uh, in 1993, Sir Mix-a-Lot won a Grammy for his tasteful ode to the female form, Baby Got Back. And in 2013, Macklemore and Lewis won four Grammys for their album Thrift Shop. Um, despite the misogyny that really seems has seemed rampant in rap music at certain times, um, women have been a mighty force uh, from the very beginning. Um, Roxanne Shante, Salt and Pepper, MC Light, Queen Latifah, these are some of the pioneers of the early rap uh, movement. Um, and they were there at the very beginning. Um, over the years, female rappers have dominated the charts. Um, they um, have easily crossed over into the pop market, um, you know, onto the regular standard pop charts. And uh, several of them are uh, considered like the top earners ever in uh, of rap music, including Nicki Minaj, Little Kim, and DJ Spinderella, all of whom are on the Billboard list of top uh, rap earners ever. Um, rap is really a global phenomenon now. Um, it provides an outlet for anyone who feels disenfranchised, um, and also to those who want to party, um, and those who feel disenfranchised and want to party. <laughs> um, it gives them all an opportunity to express themselves. And if you're not convinced that rap is, in fact, here to stay, um, in 2009, The Roots, which is a rap soul group that started making music in the 1980s, was uh, brought on to be the house band for the Tonight Show. And so we now have essentially a rap hip hop uh, group as our Doc Severinsen for a new era. And our final genre of the presentation, New Soul. So first a little background. The term rhythm and blues was first used in the late 40s to describe any music produced by African Americans for African Americans. Time progressed and the definition uh, changed a little bit. As with all forms of modern popular music, new soul, R&B, soul, uh, roots can be traced back to the blues. However, its complexity evolved from the three chords, five notes, and repetitive lyrical structure of its musical parent. Through the influence of gospel and jazz, R&B featured a toe-tapping groove from the bass and drums, which set the foundation for great melodies from a combination of keyboards, horns, and guitars, nicely finished with a lead and background vocals. By the early 60s, R&B was branching off into the subgenres such as soul and funk. With soul, you have the same solid foundation and melodies, but the emphasis was on the emotional presentation of the vocalists. Aretha Franklin would be one of the best examples of, of a soul artist. And with funk, you have the same polyrhythmic layers with tight starts and stops set in the groove for the vocalists to accent their lyrical delivery with grunts, groans, and screams. Uh, think of James Brown, or in this case, George Clinton. Fast forward several decades, and I'm happy to call your attention to a resurgence in the classic sounds made popular by the Stax and Motown labels. Several very talented artists are paying homage to the pioneers of R&B with a genre we call neo-soul or new soul. And I have a few suggestions for you. So the first one is Mayor Hawthorne. Don't let the Buddy Holly glasses and the cardigan fool you. This guy can sing. If you're a fan of the Temptations, the Impressions, you may enjoy his recordings. Next one is Raphael Sadiq. It's one of my favorites. Sadiq started out with the band Tony, Tony, Tony. Then he moved into production. 
It's like Aretha Franklin and Smokey Robinson had a kid. It's just amazingly, amazingly soulful sort of stuff. Stone Roll and it's absolutely fantastic CD. Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. So Aretha Franklin will always be the queen of soul, but Sharon could easily be the princess. They have several releases, all is just solid, solid productions, wonderful, wonderful tunes. Black Joe Lewis and the Honey Bears. If you put on their CD, Scandalous, sit back, you close your eyes, and you realize, man, James Brown and Holland Wolf must have had a huge influence on their music. And you probably won't be sitting for too long because it is infectious. Wargone. Now, upon first listen to this band, you may think, so what? Another wannabe soul band. But as you pay closer attention, you'll hear music. It's got a strong southern grooves made so famous in the 60s and 70s by the Swampers at Muscle Shoals. You'll hear the bluesy Memphis sounds of Booker T and the MGs, and you'll also hear some world influence, Afrobeat from Nigeria. It's all rolled up into a nice, neat little package. Lake Street, da Lake Street Dive It's one of my new favorite bands. Uh, formed of the Boston's uh, New England Conservatory, they give us a back-to-basics R&B with simple arrangements wonderfully led by soulful, soulful vocals. These guys do a slowed down soulful cover of the Jackson 5's I Want You Back and it, it makes the song sound completely brand new. It's wonderful. Kings Go Forth. This band reminds me of Curtis Mayfield's solo work. Solid bottom, funky guitars, tight horn section, all driving the sound forward and it's topped off by a trio of singers who would fit nicely with any of the best soul and funk groups from the 70's. Fits in the Tantrums. Saw Fits in the Tantrums at Bumper Shoot a while back. The LA crew does a wonderful job of capturing the Philly sound made popular by Hall and Oates. The New Master Sounds. These guys, they epitomize the funky, soulful instrumentals from soundtracks of the late 60s and early 70s movies where the music was more often than not the best part of the film. Quadrant. They have two releases, um, which I really like. I saw them a couple of years ago and can't get over how much their pop-leaning approach to R&B reminds me of the Supremes. In fact, if Diana Ross was just starting her career at this stage of the game, I think this is kind of what she'd sound like. This is the stuff she'd be choosing. And then I got a couple of New Orleans groups. This one's galactic. Uh, pick up any of their gifts, discs, put them in the player and try to sit still. It's just amazing. These guys, they have the solid uh, quintet on, uh, uh, excuse me, lost my place here. On the other side of Midnight, they, it's a series of live performances, and they have just about anyone in the music scene in New Orleans uh, featured on that album. Wonderful collection. Trombone Shorty. I saw these guys a couple times a few years ago, and they are hand down, hands down one of the best live acts I've ever seen. Jazzy, funky, soulful. Their live acts draws the audience in with call and response cor choruses, and there's this get up out of your seats and dance groove that they just lay down. They're just absolutely fantastic. And they're young. I don't think any of them are over 30. And then... This group is right here from our very own Pacific Northwest, Eldridge, Eldridge Gravy and the Court Supreme. So take Sly Stone, James Brown, and George Clinton, roll them all up into one, and you get this 14-member band playing funk with a capital F. Their live shows are not to be missed. You put on any of their CDs, and you'll no longer need your gym membership. And then the last one I have is another Northwest band, Mock Tube. Honestly, these guys were the first new, new soul uh, band to grab my attention. And they're also the first band I heard of using crowdsourcing to fund their recordings. Reggie Watts, who's in the middle, the lead singer, he's got amazing vocal range, does this wonderful sort of vocal acrobatics. But the band, the entire band, they're all top shelf musicians and they're uh, tight, super tight. Um, I would encourage you to listen to Kronos. They have, I think, seven CDs at this point. Kronos is still one of my favorites. So that's our uh, presentation. Thanks for listening. And uh, hopefully when someone asks for some recommendations for country and western, contemporary Christian, or some gangster rap, you'll have more confidence in suggesting a title or two. And I, I believe 
if, if you email either one of us, um, yep, I can. I'm going to put mine in, in right here. Um, we have a list of all the bands and recordings that we talked about, and we'd be happy to share those with you. And then, Katie, you said something about you're going to have the playlist. So hang on. I'll hand it back to Katie. Yeah, please send us an email, and uh, we can send you the list of our everything we talked about. And then I've created a list on Spotify of the music that uh, we had playing in the background when we've done this live and it's just a it's a song list of uh, of every genre that we've talked about here um but it's a, and it's a killer song list we worked so hard on it you wouldn't believe um so anyway thank you so much for joining us and uh yeah if you have any questions we'd love to uh, take them uh, would you be willing to copy and paste the URL yes. for the Spotify list into our chat? That way, uh, anybody coming in on the archive won't have to email you. Yes. I mean, we still have archives seven years old that people yes. access. So. Hold on one second. Yeah. Let me find it, and thank I will you. do that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Katie and John, for a really comprehensive, excellent uh, program, and I uh, got lo a lot out of it. Uh, and I'm so happy we'll have an archive for other people to ta uh, learn from it. It's really excellent. Uh, just a little commercial announcement. There's going to be another first Tuesdays in June, June 2nd. It's going to be called uh, Rockstar Rural Librarian. So come back and join us again. And thanks, everybody, for coming today. Okay, great. I see that you posted the link. Thank you.